All right, it's 12 o'clock. Let's go ahead and do it. Um, so, uh, goals, for, uh, goals for today. Uh, well, first off, thanks for joining me again. But the goals for today are to, as always, understand our biggest nutritional hurdles. Uh, talk quite specifically about them. Um, I posted a few um, subject matters uh, earlier on this week, and people sent me some questions about it, and hopefully I'll try and tailor my, my uh, general responses to the specifics of the questions. Um, but for you to basically have some nutritional and habitual takeaways, some like actionable changes that you can make um, with the information that we go through um, uh, in each session. So uh, this week's topics were number one, um, appetite regulation. So we'll go over that, what we mean by appetite regulation, uh, what it looks like, how you can make it happen, uh, go over some of your like maybe your tougher requests or your tougher thoughts about it. Um, dietary maintenance phases. So one kind of leads into the other a little bit and we'll kind of connect them. Um, so what a dietary maintenance phase is, why you might use it, why it's important. Um, I think oftentimes people look at the dietary maintenance phase as like, it's just standing still, but it's not standing still and we'll kind of deep dive and unpack that a little bit more. Um, and then also the cost of getting lean. We're coming up to um, summer season, let's say, where people are going to be trying to get beach ready or bikini ready or whatever that, whatever that means to each individual person. Um, so we'll kind of talk about the cost of getting lean and, and going over some of the pros and cons, some of the checks and balances that maybe we need to make to be able to make those things happen. All right. Um, so. First things first, the question that I got on um, appetite regulation, or like the main one was like, how do I control my hunger? The general question. Um, and then being hungry specifically at night and why that might happen and uh, what you may be able to do to be able to navigate that a little bit. Um, so we'll get started with appetite regulation and we'll get going into that. So um, Appetite regulation is far more, let's just start with this, far more than simply just willpower. It goes far beyond willpower. So from a physiological standpoint, there is a massive uh, player here, which is your hormones, um, which I think most people don't necessarily understand, or it's kind of a blanket term. It's like the same way that people say, well, he or she's jacked or lean and it's their genetics, or it's my metabolism, or it's my hormones, or it's this, it's that. And it's, People, I guess, kind of throw that around as a buzzword without necessarily unpacking it um, in a way that is useful to understand. Um, so we'll try and do a little bit of that today. We won't go super deep dive, but we will kind of talk about how they play together. Um, so I've written on my slides here, uh, eating a reasonable amount of food each day to support your health and regulate your appetite goes well beyond willpower. So just to, to re reiterate that. So it's important that we acknowledge the information that our body relays about hunger and our fullness cues. Um, and the more we understand, the more we can kind of recognize when those things are happening. And instead of being responsive to uh, what might be a mixed signal from a hunger cue or a mixed signal is for a reason to eat, uh, we can be maybe just take a quick second where we can sit back and we can say, actually, am I hungry or am I getting X, Y, or Z? From my brain, am I getting X, Y, or Z? Do I really actually need to eat? So again, we'll keep kind of unpacking that a little bit more. So it's important to know the the role that stress plays in appetite regulation. And again, I think that's subjective because everybody has their own variation of stress. We can put a lot of things into a bucket, but stress means different things to each one of us. It could be work specific, like just the amount of work that we have to do. It could be training specific. It could be family. You know, right now it's far more than that. It's obviously something a little bit more existential. Um, but stress means something different to each person. So try and just think about this as I use the word stress as we go into the rest of it. Try and think about like, you know, your major stressor. So for me, I would say it's probably like work is usually my major stressor. That's the place that I spend the most of my time, do the most of my stuff, put out the most fires, right? So work is maybe my, my major form of stress. So you think about yours as we go through this. So only when our physiological foundation is polluted with excess stress, so for me, work, for you, whatever else, body weight. So obviously if we're already overweight, that is more stress than our, our body necessarily needs. Um, processed foods, so whether we're just getting poor quality nutrients through the food that we're already eating, that is also a form of stress. 
um, and or a lack of physical activity will appetite balance become defective. So only if we've got a lot of those things, and if we have all four of them, then we're, we're probably really getting a defective appetite um, cues if we have all four of them. Uh, you know, if we've got one or two of those, then there's some things that we can work on to, to try and lower them a little bit. Um, so the appropriate release and response of our balance of our gut hormones and our neurotransmitters seem to depend upon a diet consisting of whole foods. So straight away, one of the easier things that we can do to start trying to lower the uh, deleterious response that we have to our hunger cues um, is to start trying to eat more whole foods, staying away from processed foods, you know, human beings in general, if we've been around for 10,000 years, however long it is, you know, we haven't had a very long relationship with processed foods. And therefore, you know, we, we don't have great experience with them. We don't have great knowledge with them. We've studied them in only on the superficial level in the grand scheme of things. Um, and we know that the more nutritious whole food bases are the ones that kind of um, match our biology a little bit better. So, to begin with, the first thing we can do is start just trading out here and there a few more of our processed options for our less processed options um, and aiming more towards whole foods. Um, so while we don't know exactly what it takes to manage your appetite, we do know that the human body, as I said, doesn't have a long lasting relationship with processed food products and they appear to heavily disrupt our appetite regulation pathways. So because processed foods, and again, this is a generalization, so if you want to tear me apart on the internet, you can do. Um, but because processed foods are engineered to give us a very particular response and for us to go back and to consume them and make them super, super tasty and hyper palatable, um, they have a tendency to mess with some of the regulatory pathways of our hormones um, and maybe trigger them more frequently than maybe we want to. Um, so again, you know, we don't have to kind of unpack the real deep dive physiology aspect of that, but we absolutely know, and this has been studied to, to pre a pretty good level so far. Uh, we can't go back in time, but it's been pretty studied to a pretty good level so far. Uh, we know that leaning more towards whole foods is a better option for um, for appetite regulation. It, it, even regardless of what you're eating, just start with a few less cheesy snacks and a few more meat and vegetables, right? Uh, so start there to begin with. And that might seem like super layman's information, and maybe it is, but it's good to rehear it over and over again because, you know, Pop-Tarts look pretty good at 8 o'clock at night on a Wednesday, so Pop-Tarts are always my go-to. Um, so we know that exercise and physical activity plays a big important role in appetite regulation. You know, for all the people who I'm seeing scroll up here and, and appear on, on or most of the people that I think follow us on Instagram are interested in fitness to, to some extent or another. Um, and you've probably all had days when you've trained at any point during the day and your appetite has seemed a little bit more on the money, seemed a little bit more... Um, normal let's say uh you've eaten when you've been hungry and you've stopped when you've been satiated we know that training plays a big part in that so making sure that we get some level of physical activity is obviously also important so those who regularly exercise become more efficient at using body fat as a fuel source and this can help with regulating appetite so when we if we're using carbs better for example we can avoid blood sugar, uh, blood sugar spikes, like big flows up and down. So everybody's also felt that. Everybody's had a really good sugar high where our energy's gone through the roof and we've had a blood sugar spike. And then we felt like absolute crap about 30 seconds later, <laughs> maybe not 30 seconds, but pretty close after that. Um, so getting more whole food carb sources also is very useful uh, for being able to support uh, energy output um, and avoid having this uh, kind of reliance upon uh, refined sugars where we get feel really good for a short period of time and then we'll have a bit of a blood sugar spike. Um, so if we're using more whole uh, more whole foods, more carbs, or like normal carb sources, let's say healthier carb sources, uh, we become a little bit better at also using fat as a fuel source. Um, we've talked a little bit more about like the, the energy cycle there as if we have carbs as our short-term energy, once that car once the carbs run out, um, we can start going and using fat a little bit more. If we get no carbohydrates, our body does a good job at going to protein first and breaking down muscle mass because it's the easier source uh, to get. Um, so making sure that we do have some carbohydrates in our pre-workout, pre in, our, in our diet, useful whole foods, 
uh, carb sources in our diet is, is going to help with our training as well. Um, so the kind of scientific back portion of this is that we have, uh, let's say I'm going to generalize again here, let's say we have three main um, kind of hunger hormones, uh, leptin, ghrelin, and insulin. Um, we also have something called PYY, which is a hormone known to suppress appetite. We talked about that a little bit in week three, um, which appears to increase post-training as well. So we don't finish our training session and are absolutely you know, starving hungry uh, because we've got a little bit more satiety in there and training releases those things. Training causes a balance in those, uh, in those hormones, which leads to, um, let's say, better use of our hunger cues. All right. So we know that, uh, I guess this is getting down to the crux of it now, is that we know that like social, social rituals of eating, and we'll talk about this a little bit later on in our third topic, uh, like eating whilst we're distracted, whether we're driving or watching the TV, eating really quickly, which is something that I end up doing. I'm going from session to session, and I'm stuffing my face with something that's really easy to do. And then before I know it, I don't pay attention to the fact that I've actually eaten. Uh, I've, re I've consumed something, but my body hasn't recognized that I've eaten anything, and then I'm pretty hungry again after. I have to kind of have a moment with my food so I can slow down and separate myself from the rest of the world and allow my hunger cues to be satiated by the things that I'm eating. I'm looking over here because that's where my ball is. Um, so, or doing things like always feeling like we've been conditioned to have dessert right after our meals as well. So I know that when I was growing up, every meal, whether it was breakfast, lunch, or dinner, always had something sweet towards the end of it. Breakfast was usually some form of like sugary cereal. Um, lunch, whether it was a packed lunch at school, that always came with a chocolate biscuit or cookie of some, some sort. And then dinner, whether it was at home with the brothers at the table, it always came with some form of dessert or pudding afterwards. Um, like they're big social rituals that can definitely disrupt um, our regular hunger cues and can cause us to overeat. So I'm not saying that you have to necessarily stop those things, but just being aware of them, being able to stop and do nothing whilst you eat and actually pay attention to eating is really important for your hunger cues. Making sure that you're not doing stuff on the fly and running around and just stuff in your face is really important for hunger cues. And making sure that you're just paying attention to how your meals are set up. If every meal is a big three course experience for you, you know, it doesn't necessarily have to be that way. And beginning to start breaking that cycle it can be very useful as well. Because if we're just so set in our routine of, I have a starter, I have a main, I have a pudding, I have a dessert, then every meal begins to look that way. And it doesn't actually necessarily have to be that way, right? Not every meal has to be a celebration or a big experience, which I guess is, uh, I see that <laughs> there's a Spanish gentleman on, on, our, um, on, on the Instagram feed today, and that would be quite hard, right? Because that is a social, that's kind of a social expectation, especially in Europe, is that every meal is more of an experience, more of a, uh, more of a family thing. Um, so that can be quite hard to break, but just paying attention to it is really important. Um, we know that both protein and fiber seem to control appetite a little bit better. So if you can get more protein and fiber, especially if at the end of the day when you're consuming, you you feel a little bit more hungry, making sure that you have enough protein and enough fiber sources in your meal um, is just a great way. In, in the beginning, just a great way to just start paying attention to the composition of your meal, and that will respond to your hunger cues a little bit easier as well. We know that refined carbohydrates, on the other hand, appear to increase appetite. So they don't just not satiate us, they actually make us more hungry. Um, so pay attention to that as well. Um, so if you're having cereal for dinner, there's a reason that you can eat seven bowls of cereal for dinner, or I can eat seven bowls of cereal for dinner, right? It's that they're highly palatable, super refined, and there's nothing like keeping going back to more and more and more and more frosties or whatever it is that we're eating. Um, I think everybody has probably done that at some point. <laughs> I'm letting away all my dietary secrets here. Um, so we know that dietary fat kind of has mixed results in that respect. Um, if it's mixed with a carbohydrate, it seems to do pretty well. But if our goal is to keep our, gen our calories generally a little bit lower, focus on protein and fiber as the ways to satiate yourself towards the end of the day. Um, so we've covered a good few things here, um, and hopefully you have some kind of takeaways. I do have uh, maybe one or two more slides on this, but I want to make sure that we get to the other things as well. Um, nutrient timing is the last thing I want to talk about in terms of appetite. Uh, regulation, which is one of the things I'll always say to people 
in pretty much every format is we want to try and eat for the things that we're about to do, not for the things we've just done. And for anybody who's done any kind of nutrition coaching or, or training coaching with me, it, they've probably heard that before. Um, we want to fuel our outputs. And typically when we wake up in the morning, our days are busier earlier in the morning. They gradually get less busy throughout the day. So we want to make sure that we don't just save our calories towards the end of the day and treat yourself towards the end of the day and consume all your calories because that means that earlier on in the day, you've been doing your activities with less than enough fuel or suboptimal fuel sources. Um, so making sure that you eat for what you're about to do, not what you've just done. You can still eat a large meal at night. And by large, I mean it can fill a plate, but it doesn't have to be calorically dense. It can be nutrient dense, it can be a large meal because there's only so many calories you can get from a bag of spinach. And there's only so many calories you can get from a lean protein. Uh, so you can still eat a lot of food at night, especially if you're getting protein and fiber in, in there. Um, but you don't have to eat a lot of calories at night, right? So it's just the composition of your meals throughout the day. Try and get some carbohydrates pre and post training in terms of fueling and recovering from your training. Try and start your morning with a good blend of all three. So if you're training first thing in the morning, that's a different conversation. But and then when you get towards the end of the day, if your day begins to wind down in a classic kind of nine to five fashion, you can still eat a lot of food, but making it more protein and fiber based, more cruciferous vegetables versus more root vegetables and starches, then that's going to be a better way to, for you to get enough food in your body to feel satiated, but not so much food in your body that you feel sluggish and that you've had to save all your calories to get there at the end of the day. All right. Um, there's, there is another slide on this, but I'm just going to keep moving on to the next bit. So we're going to go into dietary maintenance phases. Um, I will put up the slides and I'll pause on that middle one again. I will put up the slides on the last little bit because it was about nutrient quality. And I just touched on it a little bit, but um, I'll give you a little bit more time to see it when I post the slides later on. Um, so dietary maintenance phases. Now, this is somewhat of a buzzword. The word maintenance is somewhat of a, a buzzword. Um, I think around training and around diets to begin with. Um, so I wanted to kind of try and just define for us all what that means. So what is a dietary maintenance phase? The purpose of a dietary maintenance phase is to normalize and restore our metabolism and hormone levels from a long period of dieting. So if any of us, regardless of the reason that we've dieted, you know, maybe it's we've got a competition or we've got a weigh-in or we've got an event coming up, be it a wedding or a, whatever it is, um, that can be that event. If we've dieted leaning, uh, leading up to that, trying to lean out, you know, we've likely done that over like eight to 12 weeks, which is a reasonable amount of time to be trying to adjust uh, calorie levels. If you do that forever, you will eventually wear out some of your more normal systems, being your metabolism and your hormone levels. And people who chronically diet have a really hard time keeping the weight off, living a normal social life, <laughs> And then if they put weight back on, losing weight again, all right? So it's really important that we understand the, the reason for a dietary maintenance phase and how, how important that actually is. So the way I was describing this is, if you think about a dietary maintenance phase in the same way that we think about, um, the same way we think about taking a deload or a recovery day during our training, which is something that we all do, and we don't chastise ourselves for it. You know, if I train really hard for three days, I'm probably gonna do nothing on that fourth day because I just need time to recover. I understand that the cyclical nature of it is stress, recover, adapt. If I don't recover, I won't adapt. So I can stress my system, I can stress my muscles and stress my lungs, but if I never give myself the opportunity to, to recover, I will never adapt and will eventually just tread water. So our body views dieting as stress. And in order to conserve energy so as to minimize the calorie deficit, our metabolism begins to slow, which means our hunger starts to increase, right? So our hormone production in things like testosterone and thyroid hormones in particular are down-regulated. To begin reversing the adaptations, the maintenance phase is focus on slowly reintroducing both more food and different kinds of food back into our diet. So the foods that maybe we eat when we're really trying to lean out, we're really trying to drop body weight, might not be the, the, the foods that we eat all year round. Um, 
but it's also trying to do that whilst we maintain our current body weight. So, you know, let's say for example, I lose 10 pounds over 12 weeks, then I take an eight to 10 week maintenance phase. I don't want to lose 10 pounds and then gain nine back because that is treading, that is treading water and there's, there's not much value in doing that, right? That is classic yo-yo diet. We want to just start trying to get enough calories back in so that I'm not creating a deficit every day and just flatlining. I'm not deficit, I'm not surplus on average throughout the week or throughout the eight to 10 weeks of maintenance. I'm just doing normal stuff, all right? Not only will it serve the opportunity for you to, not only will the maintenance phase serve as the chance for you to regulate some of your more physical uh, systems, but it'll also really give you a mental break. If any of you have ever dieted for a long period of time, you know that it can be quite all consuming. Um, and it will definitely give you a mental and physical break from the rigors of dieting. So like, if, if you're trying to diet in a very specific way and you're trying to lose 10 pounds in 10 weeks, like that's a pretty damn hard goal. And although it can be done, the likelihood is that you've taken into account the amount of sleep you have to get, the amount of training you have to do, the amount of social events that you have to avoid, um, measuring out all your food. Like the, the, losing weight is a difficult job for those of us who are like, let's say for example, for those of us who don't have a ton of weight to lose, if we're at the upper end of the scale and we have a lot of body weight to lose, then it's maybe a little bit more, uh, by simpler, I just mean it's a simpler math equation. I don't mean that people don't have to try as hard, but it's a simpler math equation. Like it's probably easier to create a calorie deficit if your body weight is higher. Um, so it is very, very important that we, have, we factor in a maintenance phase in exactly the same way that we factor in a deload week or a recovery day in our training. If we don't plan for it, the thing I'll always say to people is the next step off the peak is down and you want to plan for that step. You don't want to get there and fall, right? You will keep going up. Things will keep getting difficult. You'll keep getting higher. And then the next step off that peak is you have to plan a down portion. Otherwise you will fall off and you're going to free fall. And ultimately that is the way life works. I think so. So I understand so far. Um, so a maintenance should last probably eight to 12 weeks. Most people are gonna diet for no longer than eight to 12 weeks. Um, you wanna try and match your maintenance phase pretty close one-to-one -one with the amount of time that you diet for. So allow yourself to kind of come back to a regulatory uh, standpoint of, of, uh, of your, with your hormones, with your metabolism, with your mental and physical break. So doing all those things that we talked about before. Um, if you attempt to come out of a maintenance phase too soon and transition into another dieting phase, we'll ultimately end up having to reduce our calories even further before uh, just to initiate weight loss. Because our hormones and our metabolism haven't recovered from the stress we put on them last time. So all we're doing is we're in the hole. We've never fully come back out to normal. So we start trying to go down again and we're already starting from, from a hole and, and that's not obviously not a good thing. All we're doing is adding stress on top of stress and eventually you, you know, we'll break, we'll break that habit. Um, so similarly, if we add back in non, non diet food, let's say more processed food too quickly, we'll start to regain really quickly, really get gain weight really quickly. Um, because coming out of our diet, our body is primed to store fat. So if we've just deprived it of calories for a good amount of time and we've been trying to drop body weight, and then we start reintroducing super tasty, hyper palatable food, our body is primed to store those calories even more. So our metabolism is one, slower, if we don't, if we come out of it too early, and two, we're giving it more densely calorie, uh, like dense calorie foods. You know, there's no, no surprise that we end up yo-yoing back up and we, and we eventually gain a ton of weight really quickly again. Not a ton, but enough weight. Obviously that's not ideal because that is classic yo-yo diet. We diet really hard. We get to the end of a 30 day cleanse and then we just start eating the same shitty food that we ate last time. And then, you know, after that, we're, we're basically knackered again. And we, we end up having to just go up and down and we just trash our system. We trash our hormones, we trash our metabolism. We never really get out of the hole after a while. Um, so in my personal experience, a maintenance phase is just as valuable in a diet as the actual diet phase, right? And it is to be taken seriously. Um, in my personal experience, probably last summer I cut weight for about 12 weeks to make weight for a competition. And when I came out of it, I had a really hard time trying to not go back to yo-yoing and just trying to eat all the foods that I basically not eaten for a long time to make weight. 
Um, I probably had a, a period of time for maybe 10 days where it really took a conscious effort to like start getting uh, reasonable again with food and not just consuming everything. And then actually went into a maintenance phase right up until about Christmas. Um, so about three months worth of maintenance where I just tried to normalize my food. Um, and that was a hard job. That was, that was probably not as difficult. I didn't have to think about it as much, but it was pretty difficult because I had to start paying attention to home cues. And so from a personal experience standpoint, you know, it, it's very, very important that we use the maintenance phase. Had I just come off and not thought about losing weight or not thought about my diet at all, I would be in a rough place right now. I'd probably be right back to where I was uh, pre-cut, where pre trying to drop weight. And my training would have suffered, my sleep would have suffered, my life in general probably would have suffered. So um, it is difficult to come off uh, a diet. And if you don't take it seriously, it, it will bite you in the ass, ultimately. Um, so I wrote on the dietary maintenance bit, you know, same thing as before is like, just like when we're training, we need to stress, we need to recover, we need to adapt. Stress is the diet, recovery is the maintenance phase, only then will we adapt and maintain that new body weight, that new lower body weight. If we never give ourselves the maintenance phase, we never hit recovery, and we just keep adding stress, eventually we'll bend and break. Um, and it will just, it will eventually just wear you out, because it is, again, if you try to diet before in a pretty specific way, we'll know that it's all consuming and it is quite tough. So moving on to the last little bit of work here, and I'll kind of express through this, and because it, it all goes one after another. Um, the cost of getting lean. The cost of getting lean is, if you've done it before, you'll know what I'm talking about. If you've really taken a uh, drop in body fat seriously before, or not seriously, but like if you've really made a conscious effort to try and drop body fat before, it does, it can take a lot, and it will take a lot of decisions and choices as to maybe things that we avoid. So I'm going to use a reference point here of the things that we see online, the, the fitspo, the no days off, the Instagram body, the abs for days, hashtags. Um, those people are, you know, if, unless, if they're not telling the truth, and by telling the truth, I mean, if they're not referencing how difficult it is and how hard it is to be separated from, from social environments, how hard it is to be hungry when they go to bed at night, if they're not telling you that and they're just saying to you, hey, I woke up like this and uh, you can do this too with three installments of $7.99.95, uh, they're talking horse shit. Uh, and there is no, there is no uh, substitute for the, the science of calories in versus calories out, however we do it. There is no substitute for the... If you like people will say like all you need to do is just try that little bit harder and you you can look just like me like most of the time those people are either genetically gifted or they're lying to us about how good life is and instagram is a great lens as to how nice life is not how hungry i was when i went to bed the last seven nights in a row and how miserable i feel and how many you know how many friends barbecues and work night outs i missed um, so there's lots of things to consider when it comes to the cost of getting lean. Nutrition is one of them, physical activity, stress, sleep, work, social life, and personal time. They're the ones that I kind of put together here. And all those things are ultimately diets. So you can crank up your nutrition, but if you crank up nutrition all the way to 100, one of those other dials will have to get dialed down, right? We only have a certain amount of bandwidth we only have as much time as everybody else. It's purely a priorities thing. So we just have to decide how much of our time and effort we want to invest into the cost of getting truly lean. Um, so when it comes to getting lean and chasing the body that we want and that we're inundated with pretty much everywhere we go, uh, and I mean like bus stops, taxis, TVs, news outlets, pretty much everywhere your eyes can land, um, there are massive trade-offs. Um, and everything we do is ultimately uh, a decision, right? It's a, it's a cost decision. Um, so I'm obviously not trying to discourage people from health and fitness endeavors. I'm absolutely not. If, if weight loss and getting, getting super lean for beach season is a goal, then I'm, I'm all about it and I'm here to support it. Having said this, if your goal is to find a manageable weight and you know, support an active lifestyle, that's also really important. You don't need to be doing the things that the Instagram bullshit magazine people tell us that we have to do. It is a personal approach and we do need to try and dial some of those, twist some of those dials of nutrition, physical activity, stress, sleep, work, social life, and personal time. And we have to be willing to see like, what am I willing to give on one side and what am I willing to you know, dial up or dial down on the other 
DAOs to allow those things to happen. All right. Um, as you dive more into health and fitness in pursuit of the quote unquote perfect body, whatever that version of the, of the body is for you, um, you'll realize that you don't have any more time than anyone else. You just choose what to do with that time differently. So the people that are touting the perfect bodies uh, likely have a mixture of amazing genetics and their habits are all consuming health and fitness. If you've got kids, a dog, a sick parent, a job, a quarantine to deal with, literally anything else, uh, you're likely not the same as those people that you see online. Um, and it's probably horseshit. I'm just going to give it you straight. It's probably nonsense um, as to them saying, like, it's easy. All you need to do is do this. Like, it's not easy. It's not all you need to do. They're like, they're trying to sell you something. Um, because when those people are doing that, doing that work, maybe it's easier for them and maybe they, tr they train that way and maybe they have less things in other, other buckets or other dials throughout the, their life, but they're having to pay attention to the mindfulness of their eating. Same thing we talked about in appetite um, um, regulation. They have to, they're having to do very specific nutrition strategies, very similar to what we just talked about in, um, in the maintenance phase. They're going very specifically on meal plans. Like they're, they're all their food is weighed and measured. They're not having cheat meals once a week. They're like they're not having cheat meals. Period. Um, they're eating very precise macros. They're you know they're probably doing two a day training sessions, and they're getting nine probably nine to ten hours of sleep each night. That's pretty difficult for anybody to be able to maintain all of those things, especially us, the people who are normal. And I mean, even I'm probably outside of that because I have access to a gym literally all the time. You know, most people don't have access to a gym all the time. It's much easier for me to train than most other people. So knowing that there are a lot of trade-offs to be had during your, during your pursuit of getting super, super lean. Um, and if the goal is to get super lean, give yourself enough time and know that you'll have to play with strategies over time. It's not going to be the kind of thing of like, hey, I've just bought this meal plan off this person online and it was $39 and that's the reasonable uh, use of my money and everything from there is going to be really easy because it's not. There is tons of variables and it will take time and there will be like an aligning of the stars where maybe... Maybe on the first time out, very rarely, but first time out, you'll hit it and everything will be perfect. And then the next time you try and diet, the stars will not align and it will be really bloody hard. But it's not because you're broken and it's not because the, you know, the science is wrong. It's because there's so many other variables to losing weight, to uh, lifestyle changes in general. So I have burned oxygen for the last 33 minutes given a lot of information, some of it my opinion, some of it my experience. Um, but as you go through all those things there, hopefully you see the, the kind of sequence of events of appetite regulation, of maintenance phases, of the cost of getting lean. For the vast majority of us, um, trying to drop a little bit of weight slowly, if that's our goal, um, for three to six months out of the year in different chunks of time is viable. Being in a dietary, being in a caloric um, deficit for a year is impossible. Let's say impossible, and you'll be miserable if not ill by the end of it. There's going to have to be phases of undulation where we go up and down here. We, we kind of take our time as we do uh, different stuff, and there'll be lots of other variables that go into it as well. Um, so hopefully, you found everything that we talked about today. I talked about today, uh, useful. If you have any questions, you can DM me. Uh, if you have any questions outside of that, you can email me, whatever you want. Um, and we'll keep doing this for as long as quarantine is going on. I'll probably try and keep doing it post quarantine as well, providing I can make it last. Uh, so yeah, if you have any questions, anything you want to ask, anything that you want clarity on, um, please do so. If not, the, I'll put the slides up later on today on Instagram and on YouTube, and you can take a look at them there. Thank you very much for your time. Thank you for your attention, and I'll see you soon.